you the fastest available verbal excursion to the 21st century brain. Jan's relentless verbal barrage points to the possibilities of a potential individual assault on your own personal powers that be. A symbolic romp in, around, and through the literal world. The bane of Barcalounger thinking and the enemy of the complacent neuron. Not to be taken for any kind of psychological or medical advice. That your brain is put together the way it is not physically from the start, but the way that the functioning of your brain is put together now, insofar as it's referred to as knowledge, that there are things that apparently your brain knows, but it really has to do with the physical operations, the way it's been established. And look upon what people would call ordinarily knowledge, something that you have, look at it as being a possession. And like all possessions, if you'll notice, up to the line of where this kind of activity starts. Most of the possessions you got, if not all, but most of the possessions you got, if you actually looked around at them now, you're not sure how you got them. <laughs> now you might remember, well, I bought that at a flea market in North Carolina one time. I don't mean that, but you look at it, and in so far as you look at it now, and you think if somebody would give me more or less what I paid for it, as best I can remember, would I take the money? <laughs> And the answer is, I suggest, that probably 99% of your possessions is yes. If somebody would come in and give me a reasonable price, they could take this. And so what I mean is, you end up with possessions, and correctly speaking, you don't really know how you got them. That is, you don't know why, how, what was the passion, what did I think I was acquiring when I got this particular possession. Look upon what you seem to know up to the point where this kind of activity starts. Old, ordinary intelligence as being possessions that you simply, more or less, look around and find yourself with. <laughs> All right? Try and keep that in mind for a little bit. And so let me start out, that is, looking at information, your knowledge as being a kind of possession. Then let me say this to you that for, this, for the purposes of this kind of activity, the only kind of info that would be of any value would be that which apparently can alter human nature. Specifically, yours. Now, if we have enough time tonight, I will point out I could make two categories for a real revolutionist once you got into this. I could say that there'd be only two kinds of information it would be that which apparently can alter your nature and the other would be simply that which is you find personally pleasurable fun with no further descriptions no justifications now there's nothing whatsoever wrong with that it was just i was not going to speak on that any great length tonight so try and turn your attention on the first part i pointed out that for the purposes of doing this, why would anybody, to put it another way, why would anybody who's seriously involved with this and has some notion, some feel for what this is, why would they ever bother with any information that did not apparently have the power, the possible power, to alter, at least severely affect, but probably alter human nature? Now let me update something that I mentioned to you several nights ago about what would be the real use of the reality behind the word poverty, revolutionary poverty, correct poverty. And I could remind you that it would still be useful for some of you to pursue off on your own trying to see some of the, some of the connections between two questions that I ask. One is, what is a foot that men have always been driven to apparently want to make sacrifices of stuff and things? You know, of course, there's always something, some possession they have that seems to be of value to them. And the other one was, if you recall, I just asked outright, why would anybody have any possessions that were not either useful 
are beautiful, that you found pleasurable. But now let me update, extend what I said about poverty a few nights ago. I said that correct revolutionary poverty would be in not having anything that was meaningless to you. But now let me extend it to a more proper size. Correct revolutionary poverty would not simply be not having possessions that were meaningless to you. It would also be in not thinking that you should have. Now we have, or I have taken it to the correct size that will fit everyone, which is the only correct size. That is, that is the only useful information. But notice, when it comes to the possessions of knowledge, what is it that you have, and what is it further that as life continues to churn you up at line level consciousness, do you think you should be further acquiring? And I'll answer for you. Information that does not knowledge that does not by any means limit itself to what I have just described, that is, for a revolutionist, the information that he or she should have, the only information that would be of any value whatsoever would be that that would apparently affect, alter his or her nature. Now what is the knowledge that you presently possess? Not just you personally, but everybody, but now back to you. But you understand that the knowledge you have is the same knowledge everybody else has got. What is it? For the purposes I just described, I must suggest to you very strongly, since we're on a short rope tonight, that a large part of it does not fit the definition of being potentially capable of altering human nature. I suggest that very strongly. I suggest a large part of it. Now I suggest real strongly a real large part of it. <laughs> May I suggest the majority, the whole lot of the majority, the majority and then a little bit more, does not fit that description. Why would someone attempting to rebirth themselves, to ignite themselves past the point that life has done, to activate what I have been calling a new kind of intelligence. Anyone who was sincerely involved with that as best they could be, why would they even entertain any innate desires that they already have to further accumulate possessions, that is knowledge, that does not fit my description? Why would you even dicker with it? Why would you think about it? Once the thought comes through you, why would you entertain it? Why would you allow yourself to be churned up in that way and to believe that you should be involved with activities, that you should be attempting to acquire additional possessions, knowledge, that does not fit this description? Why? Why, 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 why? Well, I'll tell you why, because you can't help it. <laughs> because, because it's not you. But once you see it's you, why would you involve yourself? Why would you give one thought? Once it flows through, why would you look at it and say hello, and listen to it? That is speaking of the acquisition of some new knowledge, that is another possession, that is not, that does not apparently have the potential to alter human nature. Why would you do it? And the answer is you wouldn't. The only other case would be that you simply found it pleasurable. Now to fit that in for what little I guess I need to mention it since I brought it up, when I say that the only information that's important would be that that has the apparent potential to alter human nature, specifically yours, or be information that you found pleasurable. Look at this. Look at all of the information that is available. And the more you live in the area of life's body that we are, specifically on this planet, the Western world, 
technological age that information just seems to be everywhere. I mean, it's worse than snow and smog. You know, news and information everywhere you turn, unless you close your eyes and stop up your ears. You step in it, you trip over it, people throw it at you and it falls on you from roofs. And they fly it through the skies behind airplanes. But if you understood, and of course you understood then you would act accordingly, that you had no interest in acquiring any more possessions that were not either useful or pleasurable. Because once you are able to see this, you see that you've got all the meaningless, that is useless, and non-pleasurable, that is ugly, questionable, what am I doing with them, possessions that you will ever need ever, if they, if they ever send out a committee checking on, or a quiz, a contest, to have useless possessions, you don't have to fear that you'll ever have to write and get some just to come up to the minimal level, or to qualify for the contest, or to suit the committee, the governmental agency, wanting to make sure that everyone has their share of useless, non-pleasurable possessions. You're set. No need to sweat that. <laughs> Look at the information that is available. Look at what everyone else, it varies of course from person to person, but what the city in general, what the bell curve of humanity in your state, look at what they take to be serious. The most the revolutionists would get out of it would be to find it sort of funny. Now, does it might fit pleasurable that you need a laugh is to turn on the news <laughs> and to see people seriously. It's not just the guy reading the news, as funny as that may be. It's not just him. It's the whole nexus of what's going on. That, some, that people went out. Of course, there is no, when I start describing this, it's always a matter of in media's rays, I'm always having to start in the center, just arbitrarily like a movie and like a book. So here goes, but this is not the beginning. I can say, all right, the reporters go out. They gotta make a living. So they come back with a Senate subcommittee today said such and such was going to happen tomorrow, that they were gonna do so and so. Then I can say, then it has to go from there to an editor. Then they look through all the stories that they and they decide what should go on the news. Then they give it to the guy and then he reads it. But see, it keeps going. Then he reads it and then the public, they decide that is serious, apparently. They're the ones that support the sponsors. The sponsors support the network. The network hired the reporters. And so you understand what I meant by a nexus is really a four dimensional nexus. That there is no real starting place, but here it is. And so you might find that humorous in your own private way, not sarcastically, not cynically, not ironically but that you might find it pleasurable to turn on. But if you understood what I'm talking about once you see it, it is not a fit possession. It is not serious. It's only serious to people of old intelligence. It would only be serious to your old intelligence. There is no information. That is, there are no possessions being bartered, being sold, being given away in the city that meet the qualifications specifically that I described when I started this. If you understood that, you would not take the news, you would not take the info, you would not take the knowledge that is sold, traded, bought, swapped, bartered, advertised, dangled before you, dreamed about in the city, you would never take it seriously. Not theoretically, not hostilely, you're not reacting against it but you would have no further use for possessions that do not have the possible, the apparent possibility of altering your nature. And the possessions commonly bartered in the city do not. Therefore, the information is not serious, no matter what it is. <laughs> it's to realize that the possessions that are available in the city, that which you can go out and buy, or apparently get free by turning on your radio, by lighting this thing at the newspaper in the box without buying it, but you're still buying it. <laughs> Those possessions are not serious because they cannot alter human nature. 
it is life perhaps talking about that it will be altering things that life did if any of you have to see this uh, it's been in our lifetime that the term uh, ecosystems became popular it may have been in fact coined in our lifetime I don't remember but anyway it was in our lifetime the first time you ever heard it used <laughs> <laughs> and there were great banners and marches and scares going on that we're about to pollute the, our own planet to the point, our own little lovely floating cosmic nest to the point that we're going to kill ourselves. And there were examples everywhere. And sure enough, what happened? We began to clean it up, right? But no matter how bad it seems at the time, not for the individual, <coughs> but no matter how bad the information seems, to humanity, to some segment of life's body, that is, to some state somewhere, some tribe, some city. The information is not serious. The only serious information is information that will alter human nature, specifically some individual. And that information does not alter individuals. If it comes out and says, if the new information, a piece of new information says, wearing red clothes will cut 10 years off your life. That will not alter human nature. It may alter behavior. People may stop, some segment of humanity may stop wearing red clothes for a while. But it will not alter some individual's knowledge, their intelligence. Therefore, it is not serious. You might want to go along with it. You might decide, <coughs> I only have one red shirt, I think I'll throw it away anyway. It has nothing to do with altering your nature. The information will not do that. No possession that comes out of the city will do that specifically. That is to an individual at that time, somebody in somebody's lifetime, it will not do that. That is not the purpose of that is not the form of information available at the level of old intelligence. The faster some of you realize that, the better off you are. Because it's no longer a struggle, it's no longer you attempting to piecemeal to death what might be important in life or is any of you to worry about that I keep taking large swipes at life and then I'll make blanket statements and tell you that you've got to finally see or that you will see that such and such is a total waste. And then you want to keep picking it apart about, well, wait a minute, that can't be true. You know, there are exceptions to everything. And there are things going on in the city that are important. There's information. If you can begin to see for yourself that if indeed your purpose in being alive, your one interest, <coughs> is to activate something in you, is to scratch a place that you've never been able to touch, to feed a place that you have never been able to satisfy, and that I without telling you or without giving direct hints, you must think that this is the basis of attempting to satisfy those kinds of hungers. And if that becomes your main purpose, your main interest in life, it doesn't have to be your only one by any means, if that becomes it, then all of the other possessions, including what seems to be information. You will begin to judge on that basis. And it's not an intellectual activity once you understand it. And you don't have to go around being a hermit. You don't have to turn off your radio. You don't have to refuse to look at the paper on the basis, well, I don't want this kind of superfluous, useless information clogging up my brain. It will only clog up down here at this level if you let it. And it's not going to clog it because it was made to feed that level. That doesn't mean that you have to read the news. It just becomes almost irrelevant. A little smog is not going to kill anybody. A little noise is not going to drive anyone deep. 
itself. But it stops your nervous system once you understand it. Your nervous system no longer responds to the information, the possessions being traded in the city. And every day, some brand new possessions, that is, brand new information, brand new news. Every day, it's served up. And the way things stand now, the way life is moving along toward the yellow circuit areas, the more intellectual you are at the, by city definition, the more sophisticated you are, etc., the more you're inclined to want to feed on the news, to be almost a junkie, to almost be addicted to whatever the latest information is. That is a decent hobby, as long as you understand it is not real food. <laughs> it can be fun if you've got nothing else to do. Some of you probably find it more agreeable as a part-time hobby than reading fiction. <laughs> We're trying to perform oral surgery on yourself. <laughs> but there is nothing serious in it. To believe that there is is to further acquire possessions that are unimportant and meaningless. And they go with everything else you've got. Let me see if I can twist your attention a little bit in this same area and point this out. It's for revolutionary purposes and from a more complex view. Regardless of what seems to be true in the city, regardless of what old intelligence thinks, in no form is there one truth. There are parallel truths. There is no one conclusion but many, which of course in the city won't skate. If you're going to have a conclusion to something, you've got a conclusion. That's what a conclusion is, right? Eh. There's not a conclusion. There's numerous conclusions. There is not, once you get above the level of old intelligence, once you get above the city level of the operations of the yellow circuit, the man's nervous system, then you no longer are dealing with. It is not a matter of there being a single flow of energy, which is what I was talking about in a different way to say that there is not a truth or one truth. They're parallel truths, as they would call it in the city. If I had some other recourse, Verbally, I would not even call it that, but I've got to start somewhere that we all think we're referring generally to the same thing. But there is not, once you get past the point of worrying about it in words, of me saying truth or conclusion, there is not one single energy flow. And yet to the nervous system as it is now, there seems to be. That is a part and parcel of there being binary consciousness that there only seems to be the ability for it to switch on and there's a single flow. You're aware that there's another flow, like would be the off when you're on, so that when you're thinking what's true, you're aware of the fact, well, there is what's false. I'm not thinking that. So what is activated is on the basis of the sensation that there is a single flow of energy, and there is not. What you're dealing with, once you get above this level, is like a savanna, an estuary, a floodplain, an ocean of info, but not a single stream. And ordinary intelligence cannot think past that. Ordinary intelligence might have laughed at what I said of suddenly drawing in savannas and estuaries. But ordinary intelligence is going on. Sound like something funny verbally. Because the energy that runs the nervous system can only be thought of at the old level as being a single flow. That is a part of the intellect of man, the thinking of man, always believing that there is a truth somewhere. Not only a philosophical or theoretical, a big truth, but in any given instance, there is a truth in the instance. 
Why do women treat me the way they do? Well, why do I have the, the attitude I seem to have toward women? Why do I attract the same kind of sexual partners all the time? Why do I have bad financial luck time after time? Why, 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 why? Ordinary thinking tells you, whether you can ever find it or not, that there is a answer. Oh, all right, an answer. <laughs> Tired thing with people that met a BA from the University of Mississippi and don't know what DEEF means. And <laughs> it's just a joke. <laughs> You see that tide is not one that causes the other, but here we're in one of those beautiful places because of single flow, apparent single flow of energy through the human nervous system and because of binary consciousness, then the very thing I'm about to describe, binary consciousness, can't even hear when I'm talking about it. Remember? <laughs> the reason even though I've told you that one thing does not cause the other, but it's tied to it. I can say that there's a reason, among others, that there seems to be a truth, that everyone will say there's got to be a truth and answer to any question, and nobody ever thinks about it, but there is a chemical, there is a biological reason for that. Now, ordinary thinking would tell you, oh, no, that's silly because any problem, any question, has a solution. Now, some of you, it has a solution, it has a solution. Why would it have more than one solution? They might say, all right, maybe that's possible. But all you need is one. <laughs> <laughs> but then if I said, well, no, don't, don't get too involved with you imagining some very material problem and then multiple solutions, now let's get into the non-material, the questions concerning human life, human nature, the whys and wherefores of the stock market, the non-material, then would you say that there is an answer to every question? And city intelligence of all stripes, no matter the educational background, that is, no matter the possessions of the individual's brain, it has no recourse. It says, well, yes. That, all right, for every question, assuming that every question has an answer, then it has an answer. Right. And so what I said, that there is no such thing as one answer. There are parallel answers. There is no one truth. There are parallel truths. Then ordinary intelligence says, well, that's silly, unless you're speaking metaphorically. And which, of course, I never do, and I would take it personally. <laughs> I'd be personally offended. But that is all ordinary thinking could do with that. But it would say that it's only logical. It would say it only fits into the realm of reason, that anything beyond that would not even qualify as being suitable to consider. That if I'm inferring that for any problem, there is parallel solutions, parallel answers, parallel truths. Not a truth, but parallel. Not one conclusion to be drawn from anything, but many. I said many on purpose. I didn't say two or five. I didn't say a dozen. I didn't say an infinite. Believe it or not, I, a lot of times I say what I intend to say. Many, 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 many. Many. Everybody knows that, or you can go look it up if you're vague. Many. As long as it is the matter that it is a single flow of energy, as far as intelligence can tell at that level, that is driving it, it cannot see this. There cannot be more than one truth about something. Science would fall apart, right? Yeah, you're right. Our morals would collapse. Yes, they would. <laughs> Civilization would probably fall apart. Yeah, it probably would. <laughs> then are the, is ordinary intelligence then going to wait for me to say, okay, I give in. You're right. <laughs> One thing does not cause another again, but there you are. That 
this sort of thing will not be seen in the city because what they described would be a fair description that if suddenly people realize this, things would fall apart. You could not depend on two and two being four, for instance. You could not trust any of the laws of classic or new physics. You couldn't trust anything because everything has a proper truth to it, a proper solution, a proper answer, whether you know it or not, whether the people you're dealing with seem to know it or not. And it seems to have varying degrees of validity as you go from the public language to the private languages. But in the public language, there are certain areas wherein for civilization, for the state, for your intelligence, for the nervous system, for life as we know it to hold together, it is based upon for every question there is an answer. There is a truth relevant to any given area and there probably is a great big truth which is sort of like the pickle behind all religions. The cream inside the donuts of all religions, if you can get to it. <laughs> but I am telling you directly, there is no one truth for anything in the city. Even though I've just told you it has to be that way, that there is. In the city there is one truth, two and two is four. Just to use a very crude example that in fact, it's shaky, but two and two is four. It's not five and it's not three. Two and two is four. And that if, in a perhaps less specific and scientific manner, if there is an answer for a certain form of human behavior, as the psychologists and psychiatrists begin to hone their art, if not their science, <laughs> and we find out that all right, certain men have this attitude toward women, and we'll get it down finally, we're getting closer, there has got to be an answer for this. I mean, it's something about their childhood, something about their relationship, either with their mother, their father, a combination of the two. There is an answer, we just, we don't have it yet. But the belief is, the thinking is, there is somewhere an answer for everything. A truth that we'll get down to, all right, some men seem to have attitude X toward the opposite sex, and the truth is, we finally got it, the truth is, blah. And this sentence, this idea. And it's not. Now in the city it will be. But it is not. Because it does not alter human nature. It is meaningless to someone doing this. It may be entertaining. And you see, I keep up some, I read some, and I can pull out stuff and say that the latest psychological or one school of psychological thought is now saying so and so or there's a new idea in economics, but it is not serious, it's not frightening, it's not helpful, unless you know how to use it and then everything's helpful. And I've told you that, you can read Superman comic books and forget the New York Times, and you get just as much out of it. You might have to read a little bit more. <laughs> no, I don't know, I'll take that one. But it is not serious, it is not sincere. The people involved are not being sincere that draw Superman. The reporters that do the, write the articles of the New York Times, the publisher of the New York Times, the president of CBS, no one is sincere. If anybody doubts that, look at the people who get reported on the news. That is, folks, are they sincere in what they do? Does the news only report on sincere acts? <laughs> What's more sincere than one person killing another, one country attacking another? What's more sincere than a plane crashing? What's more sincere than the people inside the plane dying? I mean, I was sincere to you right there, right? Then how come the news is not sincere? How come the news is not serious? How come the information of bad, dastardly deeds, I'm telling you, is not serious? It's not meaningful because it will not alter human nature. Then how are you going to take the people involved as being meaningful? It's sincere. It's not an attack on other people. Now to you, go look in the mirror. When you wake up in the morning, let's say that you're at best, you're operating right up here at this level, and maybe you won't get any higher than that today, and you look at yourself. How are you going to take that serious, Lee? <laughs> if you knew how, you would ask yourself, 
you'd do a version of a Kairut, I guess, and say, all right, are you any more sincere today than you were yesterday, 1952? And that answer is no. You go, I'm just checking. <laughs> then you could look at you as being a source of information. You could ask, all right, what you're going to tell me today, that is what you're going to think. Will it in any way help alter me? And then your partner might want to come back to you and say, talk about being insincere, are you serious? <laughs> that question? <laughs> of course, it is not a fair question because it is not going to do anything. It's not going to tell you anything. You don't have to ask because you've had all your life. Is there any possession that you've got up there that you're going to give me today? Any information you're going to bring out that will assist me in igniting some new intelligence that will alter me? Are you kidding? Are you kidding? I could almost make this a rule as long as I'm here. I guess one day I was going to let Kairu or vice versa come up with this. I might as well, here's a good place to put it to you. I've almost said it already. But this is another scientific fact. I've never written it down or said it, so I gotta make it up as I go, but what else is new? <laughs> <laughs> the ordinary do not actually know enough to really be upset or worried or mad. <laughs> wait a minute, I can, wait, let me, let me pull it down a little. The ordinary do not actually know enough to be either upset or mad. That covers it. That, of course, includes you up to the ordinary level. But that is a fact. In the city it's not, but I'm telling you it is a fact. Ordinary intelligence, that is ordinary people. No one knows enough to properly, to really be upset or mad. And of course, you, yet they are. But once you see it, you understand that it is groundless. They're being insincere and don't know it. We'll assume that. Remember the guy told the kid, assume they're being insincere. Okay. Look at yourself. Once you can get above yourself at all, outside the limits of your own intelligence, look at all the things that you're worried about. Everything from the size of your nose to the size of your sex organs, to the size of your brain, the size of your bank account, where you're standing in the slaughter queue. Look at everything that you worried about. Then look at everything that made you mad. The dumbness of the world, the inhumanity of humanity. I've always liked that. <laughs> That's about second on my list. In fact, I can equate it, if you can, with congenital illness is the inhumanity of humanity. I always wondered as opposed to what, but I never ask. Look at everything that made you mad all your life. The stupidity of people, the unthinking, uncaring attitudes that everyone has, the injustice of life, your own stupidity. Look at all that. Once you get above it, you understand that what I stated was just as true as two and two is four, and for every opposite, for every action is opposite reaction. It is classical, if not brand new physics. The, the ordinary do not actually know enough to be upset, worried, or mad. They don't have enough information, and yet everybody is. But once you see it, then you no longer take it as serious. Then you can be, in my story of Night Before Last, my second opening story, you can be the kid and the father. That here are people standing on platforms, top of bridges, on top of each other, on television, making serious declarations, things that would, to most of the city, prove to be either upsetting A provocative of anger, 
and they simply don't know enough to be involved with either one. And you see it. You know it. And yet there is a religious leader, a political leader, the head economic authority of some state. And he is stating without equivocation that within the next calendar quarter, such and such will happen to this economy. Presidents, cabinet members, you see turn kind of pale to think about that. Reporters writing this down. I'm talking about big time reporters whose name you know. Writing this down seriously. The man says, I am not trying to be just a general alarmist, but I am telling you. That's why I call this press conference. As head of the Federal Reserve or whoever he is, Secretary of Treasury, I'm going to tell you, we have, con we have real basis for serious concern in the immediate future. The man does not know enough to be worried. I know he is. I can see that. And if I was real hard up for a hobby and thought, well, I think I'll go back to my old level. I could fall down there and get as worried as anybody. Well, Jesus, we'll lose what little we've got. Whoever it is, the man does not know enough. I'm telling you, he does not know enough to actually be worried or mad. Turn the tape over. Be right back. There is no one in the city, pope, rabbi, mother, father, president, cabinet member, prime minister, reporter, observer, philosopher, critic. There's no one in the city. It's the way life is arranged. No one is generally given enough information, enough knowledge for them to actually, when I'm saying actually, you understand, I'm saying there's no word for this because we're around the corner now properly, correctly, truthfully, actually. All those things and of course a lot more because that doesn't even cover it. It's real simple, but in the city it doesn't cover it. There is no one, life is not arranged for people, no matter what their position, their title, no matter how genetically charismatic they are, no matter what leadership they seem to be exerting over large numbers of people, none of them have enough knowledge that kind of energy does not flow to individuals. For them to actually, that is properly, be worried or mad. You'd have to know a lot more than people do in the city, assuming there is some basis to be worried or to be mad. What's available in the city? The knowledge. They might call it experience also, but it's this. It is simply not sufficient. It is. There is no grounds to be upset on the information available in the city. Now, I know people are. I know you are. Everybody you know is all the time they're upset or they're mad. I know that. But I'm telling you, it's groundless. Even if somewhere around the corner, there is some basis in some area for somebody being worried. Let me just say maybe there is. The information that they have, the possessions they have in their brain, in the nervous systems of all of them, that are making them upset is just totally insufficient. It's not even worth discussing. It's not that it's just a little flawed, because when you're dealing with this, a little flawed is a lot of flawed. <laughs> it's not a matter of degree. They just do not have, they don't know enough, which includes you. You do not know enough at the ordinary level to be worried or mad. You don't. That's it, period. So anytime you are, you remember that I told you otherwise. And that some of you, in fact, heard it without knowing why you heard it or how long you can keep hearing it. But anytime you find yourself worried or mad, at least try and remember this. I'm telling you a fact. I can always ask, I hadn't asked in several years, have I lied to you yet that you know of? So I'm telling you a fact. You do not know enough at any ordinary level to be worried or mad. So anytime you're worried or mad, at least if you tried to remember that if I was there and you asked me, and you said, well, I'm real worried and here's the basis of it, and you said, do I have any right to be this way? Then I would say to you, Jesus, are you serious? <laughs> the attention I've paid to you, you being one of the ones that kept me involved with this, with you people here in these particular groups, are you asking me that sincerely? Are you having at me? You know, are you putting me on? I just can't tell. 
because you do not have any basis for it. The basis for it is the operations of life at the city level. The, op the basis of it is life churning you up, keeping your account active, keeping itself growing. All it takes is a little bit of new intelligence, and you know that. I don't care if the, the headlines come out, a forum, it's on TV, 10 of the world's leading uh, environmentalists, and they say, without any doubt, we've gone too far, and within five years, the ozone will be depleted to such a degree that uh, ultraviolet rays are going to burn us all up and destroy the planet. And we, we hate to say this, but we've been, we've been dealing with this. We've been working, checking the figures. We've been secretly involved with this for the last two years, and we got to tell you, that's it. And you would think, if you're ordinary, well, now these people know. They don't know. The only people who operate, and of course now we're talking about almost everybody on this planet, there's only a few exceptions, and some of them you may be looking at. But everybody in the city being run by this apparent single flow of energy. That everything seems to have a conclusion, everything seems to have, if we don't have it fully in our grasp, an answer. A final outcome of the way that we're moving in any direction. I just picked out environmentally. But those who state, which is everybody, those who state that all right, there is an answer up here. There is a payoff coming. If for no other reason, once you understand that, that's a dead giveaway. The only people who talk and are taken seriously, who talk about important things in the city, are those who don't know. <laughs> that's the way it is. <laughs> as long as I'm here, how about another little side trip for a second? Questions, uncertainty, and dumbness is Rococo. While, while, now that's at the city level, now let's go around to the real place, while Answers, certainty, and intelligence is always terse and succinct. <laughs> Try that. That makes a lot more sense than it may have at first verbally. I liked it, Nick, as I was doing it. Because enough of you have been through that. You know, what seems to be a problem, a series of connected problems you're having, <laughs> uncertainties you have, dumbness, Fits. I don't even know in the city a word that's what I'm thinking that is properly synonymous with Rococo. I used to like Byzantine, but I'm, I'm stretching that to even make it fit the way I use it sometimes, I know. But Rococo, is that not the problems, the certainties, the questions of the world? <laughs> Rococo, <laughs> staggering in their complexity and intricacies and turning back upon themselves. And I guess it'd make, what was his name? Beasley or Max or some of the poster painters during the psychedelic area would make them dizzy. And yet, when you begin to see what the reality is that other people call answers and intelligence, when it comes, in other words, the unsuspected 5D, quote, answer to some Rococo question, uncertainty, problem you had. Out of this awe-inspiring, if not frightening, it's just <laughs> looks like somebody who has been collecting little pieces of tinfoil or string for five lifetimes, and that's the nature of the problem, this uncertainty, the solution, the answer, the intelligence, the new intelligence by comparison terse. <laughs> oh. Hmm. 
It's no wonder, as I pointed out, for all enough of you realize it, it's no wonder that that which you learn and discover that is new and actually useful, you forget almost as soon as you see it. <laughs> what is it people remember? They remember the problems. They don't remember the solutions even at the city level. People don't sit around and talk about how they got out of some financial bind. They don't talk about how they weasel themselves finally out of their fourth marriage and came out without their ex-wife taking everything they had. They won't talk about all of the fights they had to go through with attorneys and how many, all the problems she gave him, or all the problems he had in his many business reversals. You might look around and say, well, I see you're driving a new limo out there. You got a driver and you seem to be dressed up. Yeah, oh yeah, well, things worked out. But hey, let me go. <laughs> I guess I might hear again, if I must make any caveat, which is a waste of time, point out that you are always, by fooling around with me in this, you're always running the risk of losing uh, some, <laughs> a lot, a majority of your ordinary habits and hobbies. Or as someone accused some of us of years and years ago that I still like, that somebody came around and was, it was really around you people, they weren't around me that much, but around some of you and the person was taking some interest in this and thought that they had finally been around a few of you for a while socially and here and there. And they wrote me a very serious communique about how much what I talked about seemed to strike them and that they're just sure that this was along the track that they've been searching all their life. But the one thing that bothered them was being around you people up until now is you seem so, so shallow. <laughs> <laughs> and it's understandable that somebody would say that. Some of you should know why I even let Kairou, you remember a couple of weeks ago, the one guy that Kairou said looked like he might have been revolutionary pointed out that he had become now, surprise, surprise, in part, the kind of people he used to hate and laugh at. <laughs> but at any rate, <laughs> all of you who are thusly shallow have got to understand now why somebody would say that because you can look at yourself and think, God, am I shallow compared to what I used to be or what I always thought I should be? I thought I'd get, I thought I'd get more and more complex and I got more and more shallow. So it's understandable for somebody to say that, but also, it gave me some hope in the person because it took something for an ordinary person. At that time, I consider them rather ordinary. They were just showing up and heard a few lectures and read some few stuff. But to be able to say that and not really make it an attack and leave. But it was like, it was so curious, like, how can these people that seem to be hanging around and been with you for a while and been fooling with us, how can it be that they seem rather sane or getting something out of it and blah, 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 but they're so shallow. All right, everybody else, see, that is everybody up at this level, you got the same baggage, you got the same possessions everybody else had. You didn't pick them up in life, you didn't buy them, you just got them. You got everything that the city says you have, things that you may have thought that I said you don't have. You got a conscious mind, you got an unconscious mind. You got everything that Freud ever imagined, you got everything that the Greeks ever said was going on in man's psyche. You got everything you ever heard of. You got that. <laughs> You start igniting your brain and your nervous system in areas that no one else does, and God is it shallow. Because it got, you got no when you get into new intelligence, you don't have new intelligence and then unconscious new intelligence. <laughs> when you start this new intelligence, it doesn't suddenly sprout a public language of new intelligence and a private language. In the new intelligence, I gotta tell you this, there's no partnership. You ain't in business with anybody. It's just you. Just you and your poor little brain. <laughs> so in one sense, can you see what I was saying? I was agreeing that, of course you learn to hide it, I, I think some of us do. Well, you don't, at least you don't try to flaunt it, it doesn't serve any purpose. But to accuse other people of being shallow, you know, that person, they really, maybe they were just trying to be decent to me. They thought since I was the head fig that they were not fool with me, but 
to call you people shallow compared to me was kind of, I thought it was good for a small chuckle. <laughs> At least I didn't say to the person, well, hey, if you think they're shallow, think about this. Who taught them how? <laughs> <I didn't know. laughs> Going from being Rococo to being terse. Is that progress or what? In the city we go, what? <laughs> That's what this is about now. You can't un Rococo the Rococo. You can't un unroll the ball of twine. You cannot undo the human psyche. Even if you could, you wouldn't have done anything except commit suicide. You cannot analyze yourself into some kind of health. You cannot analyze or think yourself like at the old level into some new form. You can apparently have your behavior altered. And oftentimes people ex post facto will take credit that yes, I did quit smoking. And you find out that a doctor had looked at a you know, piece of his lung he was spitting up and said, well, you're gonna die in a few months. <laughs> and the man quit smoking. <laughs> you cannot undo life. No one can. Religious prophets, people being converted, people changing their behavior. You cannot undo your life because you did not do your life. You cannot undo your thoughts. You cannot unravel your consciousness because you did not ravel it. You can't undo it because you didn't do it. What this is about, what all the dreams behind religions, everything, no matter how they, life makes them phrase it, is you go beyond the ball of string. You get out of town. You, you go beyond not just the subconscious mind, not just past the conscious mind. Take them both. All right, there they are. You got to go past both of them. You're not trying to fool with them. You're not trying to in some way put them back into some sort of uh, balanced relationship. There's only one place to be terse. That's where you don't have to compete with. You don't have to fool with that which is Rococo'd. Mm -hmm. Because up here there is no Rococo. It's a wilderness. It's the kind of place that if Moses had stumbled in, he would have went, oh my God, you know. <laughs> See if the Pharaoh will take us back. I don't want any part of this. No, they don't know what to do. <laughs> they look around and think, boy, is this a shallow place? I think I'll leave. <laughs> 